recently he's also been looking at uh, the process of data analysis more abstractly. Thank you, Sanjoy, <coughs> uh, and thanks to all the organizers for inviting me and doing all the organizing. So uh, I'll be doing, uh, talking about uh, understanding of generalization in adaptive data analysis. And let me start with a brief overview of this talk. So first of all, I'll describe the problem of adaptive uh, data analysis. I'll give you some motivation, definitions, and basic techniques. Uh, and this part of the talk will be based on two joint uh, works, uh, both with Cynthia Dwork, Moritz Hart, Tony Petassi, Omar Reigel, and uh, Aaron Roth. And many of you probably have seen some version of this talk, but uh, there are probably enough of those who haven't. So uh, in the next uh, uh, part of the talk, I'll describe some new result that overcome some of the limitations of these uh, earlier results. And, and those are joined with uh, Thomas uh, Steinke. And finally, I'll talk uh, a bit about op okay, open problems uh, that uh, where I'll mostly focus on understanding of generalization in the context of stochastic convex optimization. So let's start with motivation. So we'll be looking at the standard uh, statistical setting of learning uh, from data in which we have some learning uh, problem that is uh, described by some unknown distribution P over some uh, domain X. And uh, our input is some data set which consists uh, of N points, draw an ID from that distribution. We run our favorite analysis uh, on this data. We obtain some model. And then the question is, how well does uh, this uh, model work uh, on this, uh, for this learning problem, which is usually formulated uh, as uh, the question about the expected loss of the model on a point uh, drawn randomly from this unknown distribution uh, P. So of course, we don't know this unknown distribution, so we cannot measure this loss directly. So we need to use some type of uh, statistical inference to say something about it. And usually in machine learning theory, it looks something like this. We start with the algorithms we would like to understand. Uh, we assume that it's run on, on ID samples. And under this assumption, we use our favorite tools, such as uh, various notions of model complexity uh, or stability and so on. And out of this theoretical analysis, we'll obtain uh, some type of generalization guarantees for, this, uh, uh, for the result of this algorithm, often some type of bound on the generalization error of uh, this model. So in, in practice, uh, learning algorithms are not used in isolation. Uh, data analysis usually consists of multiple steps. And steps uh, often uh, depend on the previous steps which are run on the same data. So the, uh, uh, the analysis often looks up like this. Uh, the data analyst will pick some analysis, uh, say A. It will obtain some re the result of running this analysis on the data. And having observed that analysis, it might uh, use these results in the next analysis, which is run on the same data, obtain another result, and so on and so forth. And there, and there might be even more than a single analyst uh, using the same data set. So uh, some examples of the procedures that, that often result in, in, in this kind of reuse are exploratory data analysis, feature selection, model stacking, hyperparameter tuning, uh, and also sharing data sets between um, different uh, analysts. So uh, as you can see, the, starting from the second analysis, uh, the analysis that we perf perform ends up being dependent on the data. So the basic assumptions of, of uh, our, uh, of these sort of theoretical guarantees that are uh, based, on, uh, based on the data points being uh, drawn ID no longer hold. So it is natural to ask whether we can still prove something meaningful about this uh, whole entire procedure even though our assumptions uh, of our analysis no longer hold. So also know that if uh, we had an unlimited amount of data, we could just do uh, this simple sort of conservative data splitting, split our data set into, uh, in this case, k, k different chunks, and run each of the analysis on a separate fresh uh, set of data. And in this way, we would avoid all the problems which are caused by uh, dependencies. But of course, in practice, uh, data, data is never unlimited. It's still often very expensive. So the question is, can we do better than this conservative approach? So uh, this is not a new issue. If you open any statistic textbook, you will find some version of, uh, of this uh, classical claim that you should never uh, test hypotheses which uh, are based on looking at the data, uh, which is a special case of the problem that we're, we're looking at. 
However, with uh, the exception of some uh, relatively limited uh, cases, there are no good solution to this problem. There are no, uh, aside from this conservative splitting of the data, which is very expensive. And as a result, this issue is often ignored, often sort of uh, causing various uh, spurious conclusions based on data. And this uh, issue is serious enough that it has been referred, for example, as a quiet scandal of statistic by Leo, a famous statistician Leo Brayman back in uh, 1992. So back in 1992, machine learning practice was still a relatively young area, uh, which did not rely on any sort of uh, formal guarantees. And instead, this basic setting uh, looks something like this. The data set would be split into training and testing. The training uh, part was used to run the learning algorithm. And then the uh, testing set was used just to measure the expected loss uh, of the model. And we obviously understand that if uh, uh, this test set is used only once, uh, then the test error that we'll obtain will be a close approximation of the true loss that we're trying to understand. Naturally, the problem is that this test set was never used only once. A lot of trial and error was based on the same da data set. And parameter tuning was done. Quite a bit of it was done on this test set, often leading to quite a bit of overfitting to the test set. So since then, uh, the sort of the area has grown up quite a bit, and we sort of all these risks to over overfitting to the testing set are much better recognized. So to mitigate them, these days usually the data set is split in three ways: training, validation, and testing. So training set is used as before to run the learning algorithm. Then the validation set is used to do some sort of parameter tuning uh, and uh, selection of the algorithm, and finally. We still use the testing set to just evaluate uh, the error. And this sort of setup mitigates a lot of the problems with overfitting to the test set, but it is still sort of unsatisfying. In a, uh, for example, um, it doesn't quite solve all the problem uh, caused by sort of this adaptive reuse of data. Uh, we might end up overfitting to when one does a lot of tuning, and these days uh, we, we run relatively sophisticated tuning algorithms, one might end up overfitting to the validation set and optimizing towards a model which is suboptimal as a result. And also the problems which are solved uh, in this case are solved uh, with adaptivity by the same conservative data splitting, which is, uh, might be too expensive in some applications so, uh, and might not be the best uh, approach. So let's see how we'll uh, formally uh, address, more formally address this problem. Uh, so as I mentioned, our goal is to uh, find a way to mitigate the sort of these dependencies that result from reusing the same uh, data set uh, uh, in, in this adaptive setting. Therefore, uh, the goal will be uh, that of, um, our goal will be to, uh, uh, to design algorithms which will take the data set as the input and uh, we'll interact with the data analyst and provide the data analyst uh, results to their analysis, which behave close to those that would have been obtained if you ran the analyst or each of the analysis on fresh data. So the pro from the point of view of this uh, uh, algorithm, each uh, analysis that it receives is a, some type of query about the unknown data distribution. And the goal is to design an algorithm that can answer these queries uh, in this, when queries are uh, chosen adaptively, meaning that uh, the next query might depend on the answers to the previous queries. So uh, let's start uh, uh, by looking at some relatively simple type of analysis uh, as an example. And uh, these will be the, the analysis of the following uh, simple form. Each analysis will ask for the mean of some uh, function uh, for, of a data element. Uh, to say uh, to a real value, say between zero and one, uh, on the data set. So it's just empirical mean of some function. For example, that function could be the loss of the model, and this would give us the test, sort of, for example, the test error. Um, so it's e it is easy to see that uh, if you run this kind of analysis on the fresh data, then the value that you will obtain will be strongly concentrated uh, around the expectation of this uh, function, phi, uh, on a sample drawn randomly from this unknown distribution. Therefore, being close to, uh, to running this analysis of fresh data means being uh, outputting a value which is close to the expectation of the function 
on the point draw, uh, drawn from this distribution, and we'll parameterize the closeness by this uh, accuracy parameter tau, and we'll ask that uh, this value is close with some high probability, say one minus beta. So it turns out that this, these particular guarantees have been studied under the name of uh, statistical queries uh, back in uh, 1993 by Kearns. And uh, we now know that you can sort of, uh, these simple queries can be used to compute many things, for example, measure correlation, moments, accuracy, loss, and in general, run many of the uh, algorithms which are used in machine learning theory. So from our point of view, the sort of the importance of this uh, relatively simple setting that it will actually capture many of the problems that one, uh, many of the issues that one encounters when uh, dealing with adaptive data analysis. So to seize those, let's uh, start with a very quick warm up. Uh, let's assume that you are given uh, sort of, the, let's look at the non-adaptive setting where you, will, you are given k fixed functions, uh, let's say all uh, with range between the, in zero, one, and the goal is to estimate the expectation of all of those functions. So to do that, one can just use the empirical mean and the standard sort of Chernoff bound plus union bound imply that the number of samples that you would need to get an estimate with n tau and confidence uh, uh, one minus beta is something like log k over tau squared, k over beta over tau squared. So it grows very mildly with k. Now let's look at the adaptive version of the same problem. And let's uh, try the same uh, approach of using just answering using the empirical mean. It's actually very, relatively easy to see uh, that uh, if you use this approach, then there are sequences of queries so that the number of samples that will be required to answer those using the empirical mean is at least k over tau squared. And those are not even some sort of unusual queries, basically the queries that often would arise in variable selection, boosting, bagging, stepwise re regression, and so on. And uh, as you can see, this is actually not much better than the conservative data splitting. So uh, doing the sort of the standard approaching of using the empirical mean can in principle be uh, very bad. So uh, it is natural to ask, can one do better than this? And that's sort of the uh, main result of, 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 of this uh, earlier work, uh, which shows that there exists an algorithm that can answer k adaptively chosen queries, statistical queries of this type with accuracy <laughs> tau, given the number of samples with, which grows as a square root of k and has this uh, tau over 2.5, which again, compared to data splitting, is sort of a quadratic improvement in dependence on k, but with slightly worse, worse dependence on accuracy. Uh, so slightly later, a, a bunch of uh, 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 people, Basile, Nissim, Smith, uh, Steinkirch, Stemmer, and Ullman, have found a sort of a more clever way to analyze the same algorithm and show that it actually achieves uh, the, the correct dependence on the accuracy tau of uh, tau squared. They also show that the same algorithm can be generalized to, to, to so-called low sensitivity analysis or queries. And low sensitivity analysis are all those analysis that, uh, uh, that are real valued and the uh, uh, difference between the value of the analysis on two adjacent data set is at most one over n. So you can see that that's sort of the statistical query, this mean is a low sensitivity query. And also these low sensitivity queries, their, um, their value on fresh data is also highly concentrated around the mean. So this algorithm will estimate the mean uh, out uh, of the, uh, the expect will estimate the expectation of running the, the analysis on fresh uh, data. Uh, so uh, where do all these algorithms come from? So they rely on the techniques developed in differential privacy, which I guess at this point does not uh, need much introduction, but let me very briefly remind you what it is. It's a condition uh, for a randomized algorithm which uh, takes as, a, as an input a data set. It's a condition on its output distribution, which roughly says that if you look at output distributions on any two uh, adjacent data sets, these distributions will be close, and how close? They'll be multiplicatively close on most of the, uh, almost everywhere, and possibly up to some possibly small delta uh, where they are not. And more formally, it has two parameters, epsilon and delta. Epsilon measure, measures the multiplicative factor, and delta some additional uh, additive factor. It's not very important for this talk what it is. So why, uh, what does uh, this uh, privacy have to do with uh, the problem that we are looking at? And the reason why it uh, uh, turns out to be uh, 
a useful notion in this case uh, is that first of all, the, uh, it turns out that differential privacy implies generalization. Basically, differential privacy is a form of stability uh, to changes of uh, an element of a data set. In fact, it was known that it implies some other notions of stability that have been studied in learning theory, such as uniform replace one stability, even strongly uniform. Uh, and this notion itself is known to imply generalization in expectation, which roughly means that the expectation of the generalization error uh, is small. And the main technical result in, uh, in, in this early work is in fact, it implies generalization with high probability sort of and uh, r roughly the same uh, uh, error. So the second, uh, uh, sort of uh, property of differential privacy that is, makes it uh, important for this application is that it composes adaptively. And what this means is that if you have K uh, algorithms, which are all differentially private, and uh, you run them uh, on the same data, the composed algorithm will also be differentially private. And in fact, its privacy parameter will roughly scale as a square root of the number of the times you compose. Um, and this was proved by, uh, a while back by the work Rothblum and Vadhan. So now these, taking just these two facts together, uh, what we obtain that any, uh, if you take any algorithm, differentially private algorithm, which solves the problem, the answer, the, the queries with the value which is accurate empirically, then it will also uh, solve uh, this uh, will, will also give us a value which is correct relative to the distribution, and in addition, it will work in this adaptive setting. So, uh, by using now, sort of uh, answering these low sensitivity queries is kind of the most basic uh, algorithm in differential privacy, and it can be done by just uh, perturbing the output value. So, if you're given some query dis which describes a uh, low sensitivity analysis, you can, uh, uh, you can answer it by adding a bit of noise, for example, from a Gaussian or a Laplace distribution, and this will give you an answer with uh, differential privacy. And as I mentioned, this will imply that you can uh, answer the queries in the adaptive setting, give us, giving the algorithm that I have uh, uh, described. Make sense so far? Okay. So okay, natural question, can we go below these low sensitivity queries? So there are many analyses which are not low sensitivity. And low sensitivity, just to recall, is the sort of the sensitivity is the maximum difference between two uh, values of the analysis on uh, two adjacent data sets. Uh, so first of all, this approach can be applied to more generally to not low sensitivity queries. However, the error that it will achieve will scale with the sort of worst case sensitivity. Specifically, if you are given, say, n samples, this uh, algorithm will achieve error, achieve error that will scale as delta times uh, square root n times k over uh, to the one fourth, where delta is the worst case sensitivity over all queries that are being used and over all adjacent pairs of data sets. So this factor k is the price for adaptivity, but even this, uh, this part of the delta times square root n can be much larger than the error that you would expect if you had fresh data. Uh, and in which case, the roughly the error that you would be expect would be the standard deviation uh, of running that uh, of running a on fresh data. So, in in a new work with uh, uh, Thomas Steinke, we show that there exists actually an algorithm that can achieve this sort of optimal error. And more formally, the result is as follows: um, there exists an algorithm, but for any adaptively chosen sequence of analysis, now we'll think of analysis as using t points, uh, some fixed uh, t, or their all real value, given the number of samples which scales as like in square root k times t, so we have the square root k blow up, uh, will output values which estimate the expectation of the expected value of this analysis within two standard deviation of, uh, standard deviations of running the analysis on fresh data. So just to compare uh, these guarantees for statistical queries versus the previous work, so if you had the statistical queries, which again functions of a, uh, over, uh, of a single domain element, so to answer statistical queries with range, say, minus b, b, we'll assume that it's finite at least, the, our algorithm will, give, uh, will achieve error, which is the standard deviation 
of this query divided by square root n because of uh, uh, using, uh, because, we, uh, uh, because of we have multiple samples, and times this, uh, this price for adaptivity, whereas the value perturbation-based algorithm that we have described will have uh, the factor b, which is the maximum, uh, which is the range instead of the standard deviation, and we know that in many application the range will be much larger than the standard deviation. So let me tell you a little bit about the algorithm, uh, which you refer to as a stable median because it's basically a variant of the median, of the classical median algorithm. <laughs> and it works as follows. We, given that data set, we split it into sort of a chunks of uh, each of which is of size t, uh, the, the input to, to each of the analysis. And uh, there are m different chunks of this size. We run the analysis that we would like to execute on each of those chunks, collect the values, and let the set of values be denoted by, uh, by u, and we'll plot them here. Now uh, we basically use a, uh, we run an approximate median algorithm on this uh, set of values, and approximate media is, uh, median is any value which is larger than one third, or the bottom one third of the values uh, uh, in the set, and uh, smaller than the top one third of the values. And we want to find this uh, median with uh, differential privacy, although now the differential privacy will be not, uh, sort of will be uh, applied not to the entire data set S, but only to this relatively small set of uh, values that we have um, extracted. So, uh, so this is a relatively basic and natural problem. Uh, and let's see, so let's see how it can be solved. Actually, its complexity has uh, been kind of resolved only relatively recently in the work uh, of uh, Boon, uh, Nissim, Stemmer, and uh, Vadhan, who show, first of all, that uh, to solve this problem with differential privacy, you will need to assume uh, some sort of discreti uh, discretization of, um, of this ground set. So you need to assume that there is a finite number of values t uh, from, which you, uh, from which you'll be selecting the, the median. And they show an algorithm which, uh, whose complexity scales as a two to the of log star of the number of uh, values in the ground set, which again, for all practical uh, purposes, is an extremely small uh, value. And they also show that this dependence on log star is actually necessary. Uh, at least uh, omega of log star samples will, will be required. Uh, so uh, this is a relatively involved algorithm. So instead, we'll use a simpler one, which is based on the Again, classical algorithm of McSherry and Talvar in, uh, in, from differential privacy. And this algorithm will output a value v from this grid, discretized grid, uh, with probability which is just proportional to, uh, in some sense, the distance between the rank of this value, the number of uh, elements which, in the set u which are smaller than this, uh, this element, and uh, the median, the m over two, so the values which are closer to the median will be output with very high probability and this exponential uh, probability will decay as you go away uh, from the uh, median. So it's, uh, for this algorithm, it's not hard to show that it will uh, require O of uh, uh, log R uh, divided by epsilon samples. So which still seems rather wasteful given that we'll have to kind of sample uh, log R times, but actually because this it's a median algorithm, it also combine confidence simplification, so we'll basically get uh, both, both high confidence and uh, stability for the price of a single log factor, so actually increase in sample complexity will be more like a, a constant and maybe even small, very small constant. So uh, let me uh, briefly uh, mention how we analyze it. So the base, uh, the sort of the key, uh, the key result is, uh, that we use is that differential privacy approximately preserves quantiles of a distribution. Uh, a bit more formally, uh, we show that if there is some differentially private algorithm, which given that this data set U of size M, output, the algorithm outputs a function phi of an element of a data set uh, and also some real valued, then with high probability of a sampling of this data set uh, from some distribution D, uh, <coughs> and the, uh, taking the function phi and the value V to be the output of the algorithm, the, this probability, which is the true quantile of the value v for this uh, function phi, is close to the empirical quantile of, again, the same value uh, for, the function, uh, for the same function apply 
to the uh, uh, to, to an element of the data set. So now from this theorem, what we obtain that if we have a value which is within one third and two third of empirical, empirical quantiles, which is the definition of our uh, uh, approximate median, then this value will be also within one fourth and three fourth of the true quantiles for, for appropriate choice of parameters. And that's also in particular implies that it will be within two standard deviations of the uh, true mean. And uh, uh, in addition, so, 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 so okay, so let me mention that this analysis is based on a reduction to sort of this uh, analysis that has previously done for statistical queries that is relatively involved if you uh, want to obtain high uh, probability bounds. But one nice feature of uh, the analysis we give here is that if uh, this phi is uh, well concentrated, then we can also get much simpler, much more accessible analysis uh, which proves high probability bounds uh, for this statement. Okay, so let's, that's all that I wanted to say about the, uh, the positive result. Let me now uh, describe some of the limitations. So first of all, it has been uh, shown a, a while back by Hart and Ullman, and uh, then improved by Steich and, and Ullman, uh, that uh, basically if you don't make any assumption either on the distribution or, or, or the algorithm, then any algorithm for answering k adaptively chosen statistical queries with accuracy tau will require the number of samples which, which scales as the square root of k. So in some sense, our algorithm is the best one can achieve without any additional assumptions, although one can do slightly better in low dimensions and inefficiently. So there are some assumptions for this result. So one. So one way around uh, this uh, sort of limitations is to look at somewhat simpler problem of uh, verifying the responses to queries where basically uh, one can again use uh, algorithms from differential privacy to show that uh, given a number of samples which scales as a log k times sort of square root c, one can verify uh, k queries as long as at most c of them fail the verification step. Uh, so, and using this algorithm, one can build some, some nice application. For example, one can do uh, data splitting only if overfitting happened. Uh, one can uh, get a holdout, which is reusable for, uh, and still has uh, some provable guarantees. And also one can uh, uh, basically maintain the public leaderboard in a competition uh, with some provable guarantee, which was uh, shown by Blum and Hart. So another uh, sort of open problem is um, really, yeah. So is there a factor tau gap between the upper bound and the lower bound? There is also a factor tau gap, yes. That, uh, that's sort of a second order uh, open problem here. Um, uh, yes, so, um, but another related open problem is proving, uh, is understanding the case where basically we restrict the uh, analyst to not have any sort of, uh, to not depend on the unknown distribution P, the sort of the lower bound, the attack in the lower bound requires coordination between the analyst and the unknown distribution P. And the question can, would this, uh, what is the sample complexity of this adaptive data analysis with, uh, without such coordination? Uh, specifically, one can ask, does there exist a, a specific statistical query analyst, analyst which only use these simple statistical queries, such that the queries which are produced by this analyst will require more than all of log k samples to answer. And here with, again, say some fixed accuracy for simplicity uh, of 10% and confidence. So there is still, no, we still don't know the answer to this relatively simple question. And beyond that, it's also uh, interesting to ask this question about some specific natural analysts or specific natural uh, learning algorithms which ask queries how many um, samples will they need uh, to, uh, will, will we need to answer the queries? And that sort of will allow us to understand the, uh, uh, to understand when adaptivity requires more samples uh, uh, to deal with. So uh, my favorite uh, sort of, uh, of these uh, natural types of uh, algorithms is the gradient descent when it's used for stochastic convex optimization. And let's look a little bit more at this um, example. So first of all, what's stochastic convex optimization? And we'll look at some real, very simple setting in which uh, we have some, well, our convex body K will be just a d-dimensional unit uh, Euclidean ball. And uh, the class of functions F over that ball will be all 
convex one Lipschitz functions. Uh, we'll assume also that are, uh, they are all differentiable. So uh, in this problem, uh, this of stochastic convex optimization, we're given uh, n samples, which are all functions, which, which are all functions, draw an ID from some unknown distribution p over uh, all of these functions. And our goal is to minimize the true or expected objective, which is just the point-wise expectation of a, uh, of a function drawn from this distribution, which will also be a one Lipschitz uh, convex function. And specifically, we would like to uh, optimize it within uh, some, with some epsilon parameter. So, uh, and that's roughly how it looks. We get, we get to observe a bunch of functions, but we need to optimize some functions which we, uh, function we, which we haven't observed. Uh, so one classical approach is to, to solve this problem is to use uh, gradient descent. Uh, and sort of maybe not as popular these days, it would, you would use the gradient descent on the empirical objective, which is just the average of the function that you have observed. So, and, uh, and it's the standard gradient descent. You will start with some point, well, it doesn't matter which one. And then for some t iterations, you will take a gradient step uh, and will project back to the convex body. And because we don't assume any smoothness, you will have to use some sort of averaging at the end. So um, one, uh, one sort of reason I, uh, I think this problem is interesting is that we don't know how many samples we need for this problem uh, to ensure that, that the solution that is output by this algorithm uh, generalizes uh, to the underlying distribution, that, that actually solves the stochastic convex optimization problem that uh, uh, I have defined. So what we know is that we can use sort of the standard machinery of uh, uniform converge convergence where we prove that every solution, uh, its generalization error is small, but to achieve uh, sort of uh, uniform convergence in the setting one needs, um, it's well known that d over epsilon uh, sample suffices. And it turns out that actually these, uh, this number of samples is necessary. It's some, something I've proved recently. Uh, so there's no hope that, uh, that you can Im improve this upper bound. Uh, at the same time, if you use the stochastic gradient descent for the same problem, you will obtain a solution just uh, which will generalize uh, using just one over epsilon squared samples without any dependence on the dimension d. And this is using the, again, classical result. This particular version will be due to Polyak. Uh, so, so let's see why do we sort of don't, why do we not understand this algorithm, why it's hard to understand. So let's see at this gradient computation. Uh, and this is again, it's a gradient of the empirical objective, it's just the average of the gradients on, on the points that we have obtained. And uh, it's easy to see that if you actually executed each of those uh, on fresh samples, if you computed this gradient using fresh samples, then the empirical gradient would be close to the true gradient uh, up to say one over square root n. So for n, which is roughly one over epsilon square, that would suffice to, to get sample complexity which is just one over epsilon squared dimension independently. However, the problem is that uh, sort of uh, once you make, so, so in the first step indeed all the samples are fresh, but once you use the samples to make the step, the, the iterate, the place in which you're, uh, uh, you, you now, the, uh, the x2 already depends on the samples. So basically you can no longer uh, apply, this, this argument no longer applies because the point in which you're trying to estimate the gradient depends uh, on, the, on the data points, uh, on the data. So we actually don't know how close the gradient will be to the true gradient. We don't have a good way to argue about the generalization of this uh, algorithm. So we can also look at this particular algorithm from the point of view of the, of the uh, results that I have mentioned. We can think of this algorithm as asking, uh, so each of, uh, estimating each of those uh, gradients uh, is basically just, uh, you can decompose it in, into d statistical queries. So you can think of it as just trying to estimate d over epsilon statistical queries. Uh, and it's easy to see that the accuracy that would suffice is roughly epsilon. Uh, but this, uh, there will be adaptivity in queries. The queries will be dependent uh, on, on the previous answers. And there are one over epsilon squared of adaptive rounds. This is sort of, again, to make sure that it, the, all the, the parameters would work. So, to get the epsilon error, you would need to set t to one over epsilon squared. This is a standard parameterization. Uh, so one could try to see, so how many, so this is a particular specific adaptive algorithm. And it's natural to ask how many samples do you need to answer these adaptive queries? And we don't know, just we can easily observe that if you use sample splitting, 
conservative bounds, then you'll need something like log d over epsilon to the fourth sample. You would use uh, separate samples for each of the gradient gradients. And if you use the analysis that are the sort of the ideas that I've described before, you would get some upper bound, which is square root d over epsilon to the third. It's an incomparable bound, and both of them are incomparable to uh, to the uniform con convergence bounds. Uh, and we again, we don't know, uh, and both are worse than the bounds that we know are necessary for such a stochastic gradient descent. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, one of the op open problems which I very much uh, like to understand. So that's uh, uh, roughly uh, all that I wanted to say. Yes? So th does this imply, th do you hope to give any insight into this issue that SGD seems to be a form of regularizer or? Uh, I mean, that's the conjecture in neural nets, right? So in some sense, problem here is not about SGD. So SGD we kind of e are, is easy to understand because it doesn't reuse its samples. Like at least in the sort of the standard version we, uh, we analyze. And yes, there is, uh, okay, there are some ways to see it as a regularizer, both in individual steps and also as the number of steps. But I don't think it's quite, uh, sure yeah, I, I think it's not quite related. Yeah. Uh, sorry, yes. So basically you're saying that uniform convergence is not needed. Uh, it, it's worse than. Yeah, yeah, it, does, it will not give us the, the answer that we sort of believe is probably true. Okay, actually, I, again, I don't know the answer. Maybe it will eventually require d over epsilon squared samples, but we know, but I don't think there is a good reason to believe that this particular algorithm, we don't have any examples showing that this algorithm will need that many samples. I think that I would conjecture that it uses the same number of samples just as SGD in this case. Anyway, uh, so let me go to conclusions. So uh, first of all, the, in the first part of the talk, I showed that from the point of view of understanding uh, uh, this sort of uh, uh, real valued analysis, uh, and without making an assumption, we sort of understand this case relatively well. Uh, we know that roughly we have to, you have to pay, pay this price of square root k uh, if you don't place any additional assumptions. Uh, although there are some, uh, some um, open problems, as I have mentioned, once you add additional assumptions. Beyond that, one interesting problem is uh, going beyond the tools of, uh, from differential privacy. For now, all the best results that we have are based on, on these techniques that have been developed over years in differential privacy. Uh, but it's, I mean, well, it's not necessarily the best uh, approach for the problem because, again, we don't care about the privacy itself here. Uh, so there are some nice works which, uh, which try to do, uh, to go beyond this, for example, people look at uh, other notions of stability in the space of outcomes, and also more holistic view, which is based on sort of max or mutual information between the data set and the output of the algorithm on the same data set. So, and the other uh, question, which uh, as I mentioned is related, is understanding of generalization beyond uh, this bound of uniform convergence, which seems to be closely related to understanding of uh, of adaptive reuse of data, somehow things become uh, much uh, uh, harder, and this seems to be a very timely topic uh, these days. Uh, so finally, uh, I haven't talked much, but uh, some of these ideas, uh, these ideas can be used in practice, and that's eventually the goal. Even the, some of the basic insights have already had some nice applications, but we still understand very little, and uh, we would need to understand more to apply these things more successfully. Uh, so that's it. Please let me know if you have any question. Thank you again. <laughs>